I'm really pleased to welcome you to this session as part of the Global Protection Forum. Now, this session is hosted by the Housing, Land and Property Area of Responsibility, and we're really pleased to be discussing today this question, what is secure enough good practice to enhance women's housing, land and property rights in humanitarian response? Uh, my name's Jim Robinson. I'm the coordinator of the um, Global HLP Area of Responsibility and also with NRC as well. Uh, so really pleased to be here and really pleased to see so many colleagues here uh, today. Um, you can see on the screen there some of the wonderful speakers we've got coming up. And if you just move to the next slide, I'll just talk us through uh, the agenda just quickly for today. So we're going to hear from a colleague, uh, Brigitte Odeland from the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation Humanitarian Aid with some opening remarks. We will then move to discuss uh, the experiences uh, in different countries where people are working to enhance women's housing, land and property rights. So this session, we know a lot of us how important access to and control of HLP is for the economic and social well-being of women. And there's many challenges that, that women face. Um, but what we want to hear about today are some of the things that are being done in response to that. So we're going to hear from colleagues working on the Syria crisis uh, in, in northeast Nigeria, um, in Somalia. And then we're going to have a uh, time for uh, questions and answers and some discussion. Um, and where you can bring up what, what you want to, see what stands out. Um, we will then finish with some closing remarks from Adam Schumacher from the Bureau of Humanitarian Affairs with USAID. So that's what our uh, agenda is today. Um, but before we get started with the, uh, the, the, the meat of the, of the session, I just want to talk through some housekeeping uh, sort of I don't like saying rules, it sounds a bit too formal, but, but you know, some uh, principles, there we go. We're probably all Zoom experts by now, um, but just to say, if you can keep your videos on, it's great to be able to see you. Um, I know that sometimes there isn't the bandwidth for that, so just do what you can. Um, if you could remain muted whilst we're in this sort of its plenary session now, and then later on we'll come to a Q&A &A and discussion, and, and that can change. Um, as has been mentioned, there is a translation into Spanish and French. So if that would be helpful for you, please do click the interpretation button at the bottom there, the globe sort of shape. And similarly, you can see a transcript of the meeting. So that's the CC button next to the interpretation button. Um, and if you want to uh, make comments, ask questions, um, react to what you're hearing, then of course you can use the chat function, but we also have a, a Jamboard set up. So um, the link I think will appear magically in the chat. Um, and the uh, Jamboard is a place where you can uh, uh, react to what you're hearing. It's where you can ask questions. I'd love it if you would just note down what stands out. Um, we'll adapt some, you know, put the chat comments in there as well to get a bit of a picture of how you're reacting. Um, and of course, with Jamboard, it's uh, an anonymous way to, to react as well and, and to comment. So you can, uh, yeah, you can ask the questions that maybe have been there, but you, you weren't sure how to express them or whatever. So please do, um, do yeah, do do that. Um, what I wanted to do right now is just take a moment to actually see where we're all joining from today. So um, we've set up a, a Mentimeter poll. Um, so if you click on the link that has appeared in the chat, you will be able to mark on a map where you are joining from today, because I thought it'd be very interesting uh, to see where, where it is we're, we're coming from today. Um, and it could be from all over. I, I know for a fact I am there in that blue dot in the middle, <laughs> and we have colleagues there from across the Middle East region. Uh, we see Europe, we see uh, South America, it looks like maybe Ecuador, Colombia probably, maybe, I don't know. Um, yeah, so please do keep adding in your, uh, where, you're, where you're joining us from today, if you can seen quite a spread. Um, so those in Australia, thank you for staying up to be with us. Those to the West, thank you for being up early to join us as well. Um, really appreciate that. Um, but yeah, I'll just leave a few more seconds just to 
uh, gather gather where where people are are joining us from today, so we can see the the reach of our discussions and the different perspectives. So we have yes, yeah, it's like thirteen in that Middle East region, and then numbers all all across the globe. And great to see you listing in the chat as well, joining from. Uh, yeah, Afghanistan, India, Yemen, Iraq, Mozambique, Turkey, Nigeria, Libya, um, Australia. Wow, it's the late evening there. Turkey, Syria, Palestine, Tanzania. Fantastic. Well, thank you for sharing a little bit about where you're joining us from today. It's really interesting to see that. Um, so appreciate that. Thank you. And something I'm really pleased also to uh, be able to announce today as well. This session has been sort of developed in collaboration with a special edition of the newsletter that we uh, send out regularly uh, from the HLP AOR. And this newsletter has been put together um, by um, Laura, Kirsty, and Dali. I want to say thank you to you for putting that together. And I'm going to share a link in the chat to that. Um, where you can uh, later on download, have a look, um, go and see there's different um, articles and some country focus pieces as well. And uh, looking at some of the trends around this uh, response to self challenges that women face on HLP and some of the activities being carried out by local civil society, NGOs and international agencies as well. So really thank you to all of those who've contributed, but please do check that out uh, later on. Uh, and part of that, you'll also see uh, some key messages on women, land and peace, which have been developed by the HLP AOR members. Uh, and uh, yeah, really happy to share those as well. So there's lots of follow up things to have a look at, things to see. Um, and now we're going to get sort of properly pass into the, 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 the main part of the session. And I'm really pleased to welcome uh, Bridgie Odelin for some opening remarks. Now, Bridgie is the deputy head of the Africa Division, the head of the protection unit with the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation Humanitarian Aid. I'm pleased to hand over to you, Bridgie. Welcome. Thank you, Jim. And good afternoon to everyone around the world. Very very happy and very pleased to see all those people and to be part of the discussion on this very important topic for the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. This uh, year's session focuses on women, housing, land and property rights in humanitarian response. Research shows that women, housing, land and property right, rights are disproportionately affected in conflict and displacement context. In such context, uh, pre-existing structural barriers and inequalities such as social and cultural practices or gaps in implementation of legislations are exacerbated, resulting in further discrimination, inequality and dispossession. As Jim mentioned yesterday in the opening session, land ownership remains largely restricted to men by tradition and law, and conflict makes this worse and affects women in particular ways. When women are forced to leave their home, it is their entire life and the one of their families that is in jeopardy with loss of income, of support system, of safety. In return situation, women are less likely than men to possess documentary evidence of their land tenure and more likely to experience violence in relation to their dispute. These gender specific differences require special measures to enhance gender equality in HLP through ensuring better access for women. The centrality of protection within durable solution for displacement affected communities is best represented in the struggle that vulnerable, vulnerable groups face to claim and enjoy their HLP rights. Without the protection of HLP rights, durable solution will remain an elusive concept, not grounded in reality. Women's HLP rights are particularly relevant in the context of the high level panel on internal displacement and the follow-up mechanism. In collaborating closely with NRC on the centrality of protection, and in supporting the HLP AOR, the Swiss Development Agency for uh, the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation and NRC aim to build on global and country-level collaboration 
to develop programmatic and policy approaches with a focus on women and HLP rights and how this contributes to protection outcome. The Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation will also use its position to advocate for HLP rights and their contribution to protection outcomes in relevant multilateral forums and through relationships with Nexus stakeholders and country level durable solution working groups with the view to further strengthen durable solution for displacement affected communities. Lastly, this area of work is unfortunately chronically underfunded. And this is also a call to other donors to consider this very important field of work without which the status of women will not improve and a durable solution for displacement affected people will not be achieved. I am very much looking forward to our session today and to hearing more about what is being done in response to these challenges in Nigeria, Somalia, and in the Syrian crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Brigitte, for those remarks. Thank you for being here. I'm pleased now to introduce um, Evelyn Eromagero, who's the uh, regional advisor for the uh, Information Counselling and Legal Assistant Programme with NRC. And she's also the Acting Housing, Land and Property AOR Coordinator in Somalia. Um, Evelyn will be um, facilitating our, our discussion and uh, leading us through uh, the rest of the session today. So Evelyn, over to you. Thank you, Jim. Yes, so to, to kick us off, we will be focusing on country experiences from Syria, Northeast Nigeria and two from Somalia. So just to kick us off, I will be calling upon our colleagues from Syria, NRC Syria to discuss displaced Syrian women's housing, land and property uh, rights, focusing on challenges and opportunities. Over to you, Sherin, May and Laura. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Sherin. Um, I'm talking from Damascus, Syria. Um, I will present today uh, uh, some challenges and opportunity that uh, for the Syrian, for the displaced uh, Syrian woman. Uh, we will start, next slide please. We will start with the uh, challenges, with the key, with the uh, key, key HLP challenges for displaced women in Syria. We will start with the first uh, challenges. It is about the displacement and return, displacement slash return and security of tenure. Actually, according to, to the, the 2019 humanitarian need overview, an estimated of 6.5 million people are displaced inside Syria. It is a, a large number of those are women. People inside Syria have faced multiple displacement. Lack of security tenure is among the many causes of this repeated displacement. Even now, with many people returned to their original place, uh, whether from internal or external displacement, the security of tenure remain an issue. Many of them found their homes uh, either destroyed or inhabitable or being occupied from others. others. Uh, the second challenge is related to social barriers. The Syrian constitution guarantees uh, women many rights and protection, including the right to equality before the law. This guarantee of equality also applies to all other laws, such as the civil code and the other legislation regarding HLP rights which effectively means that rights granted to male citizens are the same uh, rights belong to female citizens. However, <clears throat> the social barriers and the dominance of the customs, especially in the rural areas, play a big role in preventing women from claiming their rights. Women are afraid from being stig uh, stig stigmatized uh, if they claim their HLP rights, especially regarding the inheritance. Uh, where the inheritance is usually, especially as I mentioned in rural areas, is divided between uh, only the female member uh, or female family member. 
the third challenge is uh, it's the lack of awareness of rights and procedure to claim those rights. Uh, women often uh, lack awareness about their rights and procedure in claiming or how to claim the, those rights. Uh, this is something, uh, something uh, existed even before the crisis, but has increased during the last few years. Uh, during the, the, the Syrian crisis, uh, Syrian women uh, had to be responsibility that they did not have before the crisis. For example, many women become the head of uh, the household and the breadwinner for the family. Um, it is actually very difficult to take uh, the, this new role for women who do not have uh, enough awareness about uh, the right, her right, her own right, and the right of the, her family member and how to claim those rights. This is very important for women, to, uh, especially the women who lost uh, their husband and need to protect their children. Uh, for them, actually, a secure home is a key for survival. The fourth, uh, the fourth challenges, uh, challenge actually is the lack or the loss of the civil documentation and housing land property documents. Uh, the, the lack of and, and the loss of the civil documentation common throughout areas uh, affected by displacement represent a barrier to exercise housing, land, uh, property rights, and to claim those rights. Um, in addition to the destruction of the land registry building, along with the records they contained, uh, have affected um, the way to claim uh, over the HLP right by the original owners. The loss of those records uh, may enable the, uh, the, the occupation and the, um, and the transfer of this property to other individual and, com and uh, commercial interest. Um, next slide, please. Well, uh, if you want to talk now about the capacity development for humanitarian actors, uh, NRC have worked uh, to develop uh, with partners uh, several uh, materials um, for capacity development. Um, for example, uh, we have worked on development of several guidance nodes. For example, the lease agreement guidance node, uh, another guidance node about transfer of ownership of free property uh, in the land registry obtained by sale contract, and another one, uh, inheritance. And we have another one about uh, the power of attorney uh, in Syria. Um, also, we have worked on, on uh, uh, some uh, legal researches and analysis, uh, for example, for the, for the uh, 2019 amendment on the personal status law. Uh, we have worked with, with UNHCR um, on this document. Uh, we have also worked on um, recently on the uh, analysis of the new uh, civil documentation, uh, civil uh, sorry, civil status law uh, that were issue, was issued recently this year, 2021. Uh, and also, we have developed a booklet uh, about Syrian about stories of Syrian women, their family, and the property. This booklet was developed in coordination with the UNDP. Uh, I will move to May, my colleague, to talk more about this booklet. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Can you show the next slide, please, on the story booklet? Beside whatever Sherin, uh, my colleague, was talking about the different guidance mode that we developed, uh, which has also a lens on women HLP rights and how laws uh, deals with it, how women can access their rights using this, and it's now our um, it's also their audience are directed to humanitarian uh, worker, lawyers, or whomever wants to um, uh, know about the laws and raise awareness on women HLP rights and issue and how they want, how they can mainstream it also to their um, activities and raise awareness uh, for women and for everyone who wants to support women into claiming their rights and also um, um, improve their life condition and wherever they are in Syria. Part of this uh, guidance note, the inheritance guidance note that Sherin was talking about, was mainly talking about inheritance rights. To support that one, we also looked or zoomed in 
into five uh, with uh, five Syrian women coming from different governorate, we zoomed in into their uh, family stories in terms of women of properties moving through through generation from one to another. The story shows how it's not only about the laws. Sometimes it's more about social barrier. Where my my colleague Sherin was talking about social barrier, lack of look, lack of awareness. The stories that we had illustrate that part of challenges and it shows it shows it that it's not only in one generation it's not only in that uh in the in the generation that we are living in it's custom it's back coming from the past and it's going toward the future but it's the time it's that history point where women are trying to make changes based on their life situation and the experience that they are having currently with their situation and are making their decision based on that experience. If you can move to the next slide, the story shows the, the generation from one to another and how properties were moving and how women names were not showing neither on the property, they were not also included in that and how the recent women or the ones that decided to tell us their stories, how they made their decision in terms of their property, whether to claim it, whether to take, they were legally aware enough to take an action to support and, uh, and uh, protect their HLP rights in a way that they could with the awareness that they had. In general, uh, the stories were aimed to, um, to help not only those who are legally um, uh, legal practitioner, because legal practitioner usually knows the law, but we, we need more support from other or Syrian women or whomever is living in the region. They know that women need support more on social barriers. Uh, even if they have enough legal awareness on their right, especially on inheritance, women really knows what rights they have Sharia tells them very clearly how, how they should inherit from, from their property, but it's beyond that. It's more on social barrier. It's not only legal practitioner, lawyers, or whomever could support women to access their right. It's more about education. It's more about protection. It's, it's more about different sector who, who should really join efforts and support women to really change that part of, of, of obstacle that came into women's lives when, whenever they want to claim their rights or whenever they think that they should get some support from, from their inheritance or whatever marital property that they have, they, that they can fight in their own life with the different challenges that they are facing on daily basis in terms of whatever is going on in their life. So these stories are really good resource for whomever wants to support women to raise awareness on, um, on the social barrier, on whatever is there that is really considered as an obstacle to women to claim their right. Beside this, to support this uh, initiative of showing, of showing whomever is working on Syria on the challenges and social barrier, we also developed a user guide that is support using these stories with talking point and the question that can be used in an awareness raising session by anyone. It doesn't need to be a legal actor. It goes beyond that, it shows like, to interact with the stories and it also can be used with different type of group, not only women, women, men, whomever you are, whomever women or could support uh, the, the change of the social barrier uh, that face women and raise awareness on it, how it can be supported, how we can make it possible for women to really enjoy their uh, HLP rights. And sometimes it also comes from women, unfortunately, who became themselves and, 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 and a barrier for another woman in their family when, when, when they claim their rights. Um, the user guides are really um, wide enough, has talking point, different question, can be used by any, uh, any actors. This is the way that we thought we might go beyond and engage on changing something that as legal practitioner, we cannot change. Uh, so uh, this is for the user guide um, that we had. Can you move to the next slide, please? Besides this, we thought that we can also use it uh, and change the stories into more visual, uh, visual um, uh, type of uh, interactive videos. And this is what we are aiming to support also the user guide to use uh, videos supporting these um, activities for whomever wants to um use the user guide 
Um, that's it from my side. Uh, you can take on Laura. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe we can move to the next slides. And, and my contribution to really complement what my colleagues working in Syria, it's now expanding from Syria as a country to the region. So looking at what NRC is also doing uh, with Syrian refugee women and men who are hosted in Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq. And I wanted to start my small contribution with a quote from a Syrian refugee who was interviewed in Lebanon because she clearly summarized what Shirin and May said very well in terms of the challenges that women face. Challenges related to inheritance, challenges related to the lack of information concerning the procedure, in particular the legal procedure, financial challenges, for example, the cost of hiring a lawyer, and then the fact that, as we have said, most of the time, uh, Syrian women name do not appear in property documents, and this, of course, is putting women at a disadvantage. Uh, next slide, please. NRC uh, in the region has been present and working with uh, Syrian refugees since uh, 2012, and we currently are running the largest legal aid program in, in Jordan, Lebanon, and Iraq. So our team are on a daily contact with refugees, working on uh, supporting them to access civil documentation, securing a tenure at the place of displacement, and then issue also related to uh, worker rights. But since last year, we launched a new component that for the first time uh, was looking at property and asset uh, and rights about this property and assets that refugee left back in Syria and trying to understand what is it that we can do today who can promote HLP in Syria and most of all protect these rights, the refugee and this asset the refugee left behind in Syria, even while uh, the refugee are displaced in the host country. And as part of that, uh, um, effort, uh, we did uh, carry out a research uh, with uh, refugee women to try to understand what are the challenges that they face uh, while they live in Jordan, Lebanon, and Iraq with regards to their property uh, back home in Syria. And, and the challenges are the same as what has been mentioned uh, by Shirin. However, there was one important element uh, that we noticed at uh, regional level, uh, which is related to the fact that um, although the situation that some of these refugee families find themselves, uh, especially in Lebanon nowadays, is one of extreme poverty, we have noted and we hear from refugee women themselves that they were able for the first time, for example, to work. So for the first time, they were able to access uh, livelihood opportunities, they were able to uh, make an income, and many refugee women told us that they were the breadwinner uh, in their family. And this is, of course, linked to uh, what Shirin was mentioning in terms of demographic changes as a result of the conflict, but also being in a foreigner country and being exposed, for example, from rural area to urban area in another country. So some, some opportunity are there, uh, and women, refugee women really spoke about uh, gender transformation of their role and really expressed the desire and the eagerness to benefit from property rights in Syria and also to benefit from the opportunity to have an income and protect uh, and support their family. But of course, uh, these social and customary norms continue to uh, inhibit their ability uh, to do so. And so a lot of effort is still required to support uh, these women uh, efforts. And, and next slides, um, just to say that NRC is therefore really strengthening uh, the provision of legal services. So information, counseling and legal assistance, targeting refugee women and really looking at property back home, property back in Syria, the land that was left behind, the house that was left behind, and also exploring how, uh, while they are displaced and they remain displaced, we can protect their property uh, through uh, legal counseling and legal assistance, in particular with regards to uh, inheritance related matter. And then capacity building effort, uh, with humanitarian working in the region, but also with the refugee community, so that women and men are able to 
understand, for instance, what are the latest um, development when it comes to property rights in Syria. The Syrian government has promulgated a lot of law that affect also how uh, Syrian abroad, including refugee, can uh, protect uh, their rights back home. And um, I'll stop here. I very much look forward to the question and answer section. So giving the floor back to uh, Evelyn. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura, Sherin, and May. As we've heard from Syria, the challenges are tenure insecurity, social barriers, the lack of awareness, the loss of civil uh, documentation, and the linkages that it has to protecting housing land and property rights of women. We also see that there are some innovative approaches to addressing women's housing land and property rights. As we've seen from the stories, it's, very, it's a very innovative approach. It also looks at literacy levels. And then we also see that opportunities include extending country-specific experiences beyond the countries that we work in, but also to the region. And also seeing that gender transformation in displacement is something that impacts women's HLP rights. So thank you to our colleagues from NRC Syria. We are now moving to Northeastern Nigeria where Roda Kadama from IAM will, present, will be presenting on cash for rent. Over to you, Roda Kadama. Thank you very much, Evelyn, and good day to all of our participants. Like Evelyn had mentioned, my name is Roda Usman Kadama. I am currently the HLP advisor for the Northeast uh, program for emergency response and early recovery here with IOM Nigeria. And today I'll be sharing one of our best practices so far as far as we uh, implement projects and that drives at protecting the rights of women and increasing access to um, HLP for women, especially in displacement and return areas. So um, I would like to also um, draw attention to the fact that the um, situation of Nigeria that led to the displacement is conflict related and similar to the experiences in Syria and the Middle East, um, women particularly face barriers as to accessing HLP, especially in displacement. And our situation is not too far from that of the Middle East, where women generally are marginalized and because of social barriers have limit, limited access to HLP. And with our project, we're targeting such vulnerable women in order to give them um, access to HLP and also to promote security of tenure. So I'll be sharing one of the projects we implemented with the shelter department here in Nigeria, which we integrated security of tenure as one of the components of the project. Next slide, please. So um, this project is particularly implemented in Adamawa State, a state under the northeastern part of Nigeria. Um, the context situation is that at first, most of the IDPs were living in displacement, but shortly after, most of the camps were closed down and hence making most of the IDPs to settle within the host community. And best uh, type of tenure arrangement they can afford is rental arrangements. And with the social discriminations associated with women, a lot of them face difficulty in accessing this uh, kind of arrangements, especially for women, a female headed household. Next slide, please. So basically the purpose of this intervention was that um, the project was targeted to aim um, to assist 200 individuals, um, mostly from the host communities, IDPs and returnees who are renting. So the first criteria to participate in the project was that you must be renting a house or a room and it is targeting at promoting security of tenure and to reduce cases of forced evictions. Now, the intervention was carried out by way of cash-based uh, method, and though a conditional cash transfer, it was unrestricted in the sense that a certain amount of, um, it was 30,000 Naira, equal amount was given to all participants, and this amount was um, designed in such a way that it will cover minimum of one year's rent and extra, the extra money, if um, applicable 
could be used for other ancillary costs like electricity and water bills. Next slide, please. Now, um, we had an eligibility criteria that was developed in order to target the right uh, participants. First, like I mentioned, to be eligible to participate in this project, one must be renting a room or a house, and the person must have a valid form of identification, and the household or individual must be vulnerable. So we integrated female-headed households and families with um, members that have uh, one form of disability or the other. And then also you must be at risk of eviction or your rent due date is almost near or it is due. And then you must, to a large extent, not be living in a house with a structural damage because the idea is to promote security of tenure at the same time to promote the use of uh, um, standard housing. So we do not appreciate people living in houses with structural damage, thereby increasing their uh, protection risk. And also another criteria was that the participant must be a low income earner. Next slide, please. So um, attached to our eligibility criteria, we also developed what we call a selection criteria. And one of the selection criteria was that we developed a scoring for certain form of vulnerability that is associated with the participants. So automatically, how uh, beneficiaries that were registered that were female-headed households that had disabilities or had low income automatically meant that they were targeted for this project and they were selected. And based on our assessment, we discovered that majority of female headed households generally have no income or very low income, especially female headed households. So when we applied that selection criteria, we discovered that majority of those that were selected to take part in this project were female headed households. We uh, divorced, separated, and widows particularly benefited the most from this project. And for our secure enough approach, we developed tools that we designed in order to ensure security of tenure for our project participants. So we had three forms that we developed. One of it is called the beneficiary assistance form, which must be signed by the beneficiary stating that he or she agrees to be part of our project and is willing to comply with the terms and condition. This is signed by the beneficiary alone. Secondly, we have the declaration of ownership form, which is signed by the landlord or a representative of the landlord stating or declaring that the house subject of this project arrangement is his or her house and she is letting it out to the beneficiary of this project. Usually we try to adopt this form because it's more flexible as many of the landlords do not have ownership documents and requiring that they produce that would be a bit difficult and would in, uh, impact the project implement, implementation dearly. So we adopt this flexible method. Now the third form that must be signed is the rental agreement form, which is signed by both parties. We developed some terms and conditions, particularly to guide the rental arrangement. Now, this is particularly useful for the participants in the project. Now, a copy of it is duplicated in the local language, which is Hausa language. The Hausa language is the second most spoken language of the project participants. So it is then duplicated in Hausa copies. And each copy is given to the landlord and the tenant, all signed by the landlord the tenant and the community leader who will serve as a witness to the arrangements. So all these three documents, when fully signed by the participant, serve as our secure enough standard to participate in this project. Next slide, please. Now here are images of the project implementation stages. So the far left is the IOM staff and beneficiaries during registration. 
On the opposite side of the table are IOM staff, and on this side of the table, you would see the beneficiaries properly seated and filling out the forms. Each beneficiary must come due to the registration table with his or her landlord, or at least a representative that must be delegated by the landlord himself. And in the middle is the beneficiary receiving the cash. So at the end of the registration uh, stage, where all the forms have been fully registered and completed, the beneficiary will then move to the stage where he or she receives the uh, intervention in cash. It's a cash-based intervention. So we use uh, financial service providers to give the cash. So IOM was not the one giving the cash directly, but a bank that was contracted by IOM and IOM staff supervised the process, thereby supporting the beneficiaries in ensuring that the amount is intact. And on the far right is a beneficiary who is showcasing the amount she has received and is giving thanks during inter uh, interview. Thank you. Next slide, please. Now, as a form of support in order to, to guide the participants and share information, we developed an IEC material here. It's in English, but we also have the household version of it, which is the ones we had um, distributed to the project participants. Here on this IEC, you will discover that all the information required to understand the content of the project is represented here. We have down from the eligibility criteria to how much the individuals will be receiving to the purpose of the assistance, where it will be located and what the assistance is supposed to be used for. Next slide, please. And on the opposite side of the IEC, you will see the, um, the requirements for the participants uh, to participate in the project. This is a simple representation of the rental agreement obligation contained on the lease agreement developed for the participants. And on the far right, on the top corner of the IEC, you will see a feedback and complaint column, which says that the complaint and feedback on this project should be channeled through community leaders or IOM complaint and feedback desk attendance. Now we, tried to introduce the project through community in, uh, participation. So we worked on this project with the community leaders and it is worthy of note that community leaders in this context serve as um, justice uh, mechanism institution. They support dispute resolution. So what we did was to introduce the project to them, disclose fully what kind of HLP issues are likely to arise from our project and seek for their support in settlement of dispute. So in situation where it is impossible for IOM to be in place, when this dispute arises or the project closes and we're moving locations, the community leaders would fill in the gap of dispute resolution, thereby addressing the likely issues that would arise as a result of the project. And also IOM is also providing support because currently IOM has CCHCM staff who are covering that location. So in case of issues pertaining this um, project, IOM is there to provide support through CCCM or with my help as the HOP advisor. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. And I would like to note that um, regardless of how beautiful this project was, we were also faced with some few challenges, which included the calculation of rental amount for each beneficiary. At the beginning, most of them assumed that the higher the amount they inform us of their rental rent, rental amount, it would then trigger us to give them the exact amount. But after proper information sharing and education on the project, most of them understood that they would be getting equal amount. And with the selection criteria applied, it meant it was possible that only those who were mostly vulnerable, who fell within the category of earning less than 30,000 um, Naira or at paying far less than 30,000 Naira as rent were assisted. And also by the time the project was implemented from the registration phase to the implementation stage, it took a little while. Thereby those that were then targeted to benefit from the project 
some of them had already advanced their rent for the next phase of the rental circle. So, and that is why we made the cash to be unrestricted and it was directly given to the tenant and not to the landlord. This is in order to curb situations where the tenant had already advanced the money to the landlord, hence he can be able to use it for other purposes. And during our post-distribution monitoring, we discovered that a lot of these people use the ancillary, um, the extra amount on the rent for farming purposes, um, buying uh, fertilizer for their farms and others were able to buy NFI, shelter NFI materials and the likes. So thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity. I would return um, the session back to Evelyn for continuation. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, uh, Rhoda. That's an interesting perspective from Northeast Nigeria. As we've seen, uh, the question is what is secure enough? We've seen that when camps closed, there have to be alternatives to housing. And we've also seen that uh, when we are looking at cash for rent, female-headed households also face uh, different challenges compared to their male counterparts. We've seen us discuss affordability, adequacy of housing, and even if the cash is unrestricted, we've also seen that it becomes multi-purpose. It's not only used to pay rent, it's also used to meet a utility bill. And also we've seen beyond having an eligibility criteria, we also have a selection criteria, meaning from those that are eligible, we also have to select particular groups. So it's beyond eligibility. We've also seen linkages with the legal identity. You need a valid ID. So placing more emphasis on the issues that had been raised by the colleagues from, from Syria. And for a sustainable cash for rent project, we also see that we need certain tools for accountability. What are the roles and responsibilities of the landowners and the land users? And also tenure security. We've looked at tenure documents, rental agreements, translating them so that they are understood. And then also uh, having an understanding that disputes are uh, about uh, uh, they tend to be disputes when they are rental arrangements as well, and looking at the role of community leaders in resolving disputes. So it's beyond cash to secure. We have to look at tenure security, adequacy of shelter, and also anticipate disputes and resolution mechanisms. Thank you so much, uh, Rhoda. We will now move on to Somalia, where our colleague Fatih Egal will be discussing why women in Somalia are not are settling for more why displaced women are settling for more in terms of their housing, land, and property rights. So over to you, Fatih. Thank you, Evelyn, and good afternoon, everyone, and good morning. I know we have a diverse representation. Um, so as I was preparing this presentation, I was actually really inspired by the topic for this forum. So what is secure enough? And it started making me um, really think about that question. Um, and reflect back on some of my experiences in uh, Somalia. So I currently work with the Global Land Tool Network at UN Habitat, um, but I have uh, some interesting experiences from working in Somalia, um, particularly on land rights. And um, we can skip the next slide. We can go to the introduction. So as I was kind of thinking about this question, I really wanted to link it to um, just different um, topics. So in this presentation, I'm going to just touch over the continuum of land rights, the challenges that we see to Somali women's HLP rights, some proposed solutions, and then a conclusion. Um, so one of the interesting things that I've kind of discovered along the way is that when we're sort of asking the question, what is secure enough, it's almost a very fluid question. And it seems like the goalposts shift quite often um, when it comes to women's rights, especially at a time of humanitarian response, because we know that what precedes a humanitarian response is usually um, a time of conflict or some kind of natural disasters or climate change where people are really um, not in the best situations and as a state um, there's a lot of help that's required and these are particularly challenging times for Somali women um, we see that they're greatly affected by displacement by forced migration and we see a lot of violations of just basic human rights so in that context HLP rights almost become seen as some kind of luxury. And so we really need to start making sure as we're advocating for change that we really connect HLP rights as 
part of these basic human rights and not as a privilege and also show that even as um, priorities might be shifting, um, doing humanitarian response, we're really looking at security and safety and securing of livelihood, but that HLP rights, and in particular women's HLP rights, are also critical um, as we're kind of going through and trying to um, achieve peace building. And the other challenge with trying to see like, okay, what is enough to sort of um, secure women's land rights. One of the tools, and in the next slide, um, that I wanted to discuss was this concept of the continuum of land rights. Um, and the continuum of land rights, I kind of want to discuss it almost as like a double-edged sword, because really, it's supposed to be a very helpful concept to try and capture land rights in the diversity that they exist in. Um, but it also poses a challenge because it may um, allow for some exploitation in the sense that we can give women some rights without really giving them full rights. And so with the um, continuum of land rights, we know that tenure um, can take on a variety of different forms. Um, this could be documented, it could be undocumented, it could be formal, it could be informal. Um, you can hold your tenure rights as an individual, as part of a group. So there's really a plethora of options when it comes to securing um, land rights. And in a context like Somalia, this is actually a very um, good opportunity because it affords flexibility of land tenure rights. And one of the legal principles of property rights is that we kind of understand property rights as a bundle of rights and not just one particular right. And so it's not an all or nothing equation. You can have um, rights to access and rights to use without having a right to ownership. Um, and so there's really this diversity. Um, and in the next slide, we'll see that the continuum of land rights also allows us um, to recognize that all of those different forms of tenure are appropriate. They can be effective and they can be legitimate, right? Um, and it promotes this increase of security across the continuum. And it's supposed to be fluid in your ability to kind of move between the different tenure forms um, as your needs change. Um, and so the concept and approach are more widely accepted and it's really allowing for this global shift in understanding land tenure. And it could be a really great opportunity and now to the next slide. So I wanted to kind of also reflect on some of the challenges facing um, Somali women when it comes to HLP rights. Um, and one of the things that I really wanted to emphasize in this presentation today is that we really need to be evolving as things are evolving in, in society. And so luckily in Somalia, we're not really in a situation where there is a lack of denial of HLP rights for women. I think there's a general consensus and acknowledgement that women are indeed um, allowed and should own land and have access to land and have their HLP rights protected. Um, and so again, going back to this question of, but where do we draw that line and what is um, good enough? And that's kind of what inspired me to um, title this presentation also, let's try to settle for more. So how do we help address some of the gender, um, some of the challenges? And the main challenge is gender inequality in general, right? And so gender inequality manifests its way in society in a lot of different um, forms, and it really hinders the full realization of women's um, potential and all their rights. And so it's not just particular to HLP, but we know that the more vulnerable women are in society, whether it's their lack of economic development or a lack of access to education, it's really a challenge. However, one of the key challenges um, in particular to Somali women is, like I said, it's not the lack of recognition of rights, but the protection of those rights. And that is really seen through the challenges that they face when it comes to accessing justice systems or even having some awareness of what justice systems they can access. Um, and I wanted to just share like an anecdotal um, story. We had developed this training manual on advancing women's land and property rights that was adapted for Somalia. And when we did the first round of training to civil society organizations in Somalia, we were trying to kind of understand like what are some of the obstacles that women are facing when it comes to accessing justice. Um, and so of course there was a lot of um, different scenarios that came up, the male dominance, the 
technicalities and just general um, lack of affordability were some, but there's also now this um, more nuanced way that gender inequality is presenting itself. And so they have shared a case study of a woman who purchased a piece of land three years before, and the men who she purchased it from after they realized that it's increased in value and it's appreciated, tried to come back and reclaim the land from her. Um, but of course, because there's been, in particular where this scenario happened in Jubilad, there's been a lot of um, work to sort of strengthen women's land tenure rights. And so the deal was done legitimately and there was um, documentation. And so they knew they couldn't just come and you know, completely deprive this woman of her land. But they just came in and said, you know what, we made a mistake, we shouldn't have sold it to you, let us pay you back what you paid us, and we'll even add some for your troubles and for the costs that you incurred fencing off your land. And she agreed. And so we had a discussion about this type of scenario and whether or not if she was a man, if the power dynamics would have existed in the same way where she would have been kind of given this bad deal and not understanding what her options would have been um, to accessing justice or feeling in that scenario that, you know, whatever options that she could exercise may be futile because these men would come and, you know, offer money and do whatever they needed to do to reclaim it. So with that said, in the next slide, what are some of the proposed solutions? So of course, one of the main um, areas is for greater education and awareness to help promote and protect these rights. Um, there's been a lot of work that's been done on just trying to disseminate information as to the different legal options that exist. And of course, Somalia functions with a plural legal system. And so this can be an advantage, but it can also be a disadvantage in certain um, scenarios. But the more women are educated and men as well, right? So we need both um, to work to, together to achieve gender equality and make sure that no one in society is deprived of their rights unfairly. Um, but that education will really help them identify and understand the type of security or tenure security they currently hold. Um, and it'll help minimize um, and prevent forced evictions, which are really impacting um, Somali women a lot, especially those who are living in um, displacement camps. Um, and then again, just empowering women as decision makers. So making sure they are also joining these bodies as um, decision makers. Uh, there's been a lot of um, studies that have shown that when there are more women who are even adjudicating land disputes, more women become comfortable bringing their cases forward, right? And so really creating these enabling environments where we're not um, preventing or putting up more obstacles, but trying to be as inclusive as possible. And just in the last slide to conclude um, and connect it back with, you know, what we really need to work on, especially during humanitarian responses, one of the things that I've noticed, which is unfortunate, is that sometimes um, in conflict or fragile contexts, women are often encouraged to forego some of their rights in order to help um, build better communities and um, to promote peace building. But we know that societies are much better off when women have full rights and they're protected and their HLP rights are respected, that this really in and of itself can contribute to economic and social development and helping um, peace building and good governance practices as well. So I think that's my time. I hope I didn't go over, but uh, thank you for listening to me. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Fatih. Uh, we see that we are not settling, we are settling for more in Somalia. Uh, very similar to what was discussed in Syria, we see that these issues cut across regions and they're almost uh, the same. Uh, and we see that uh, you, you clearly mentioned a connection with human rights and it's very important to see that Yes, it's connected to human rights and it's not a privilege for women to have HLP rights. But also it's interesting to see that you unpack the HLP and it's very interesting that we see a continuum of land rights uh, that is clearly addressed by your presentation. And also that property rights are also seen sometimes as a bundle. It's also important to look at how uh, informal versus formal land rights are perceived. And then also clearly looking at uh, some of the rights that are that women do not are not supposed to be provided with some rights. They need full rights. 
And that also takes us to the issue around equality versus equitable access. When you're looking at displaced women's HLP rights, sometimes it's numbers to show that it's equal, but it's not equitable. Uh, it's also interesting to see the challenges that you highlight, gender inequality, I mean, limited access to justice, but also it highlights something that our colleagues from uh, Syria mentioned, the gender transformation of the roles of women in displacement and its implications for housing, land and property. Then when we look at access to justice, that is also a challenge, form of us as informal, but also beyond that, what are the barriers to accessing justice? Do the justice structures in this context have the capacity to actually uh, promote and increase access to, to justice? And then we will now move on to our last speaker, uh, who is Mustafa Abdullahi, who will be sharing some good practices and lessons learned from Somalia. Over to you, Mustafa. Thank you, Evelyn. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Uh, good uh, afternoon. So I will wish uh, to do a presentation. Uh, sorry, Mustafa, your uh, microphone is very, very quiet. Could we please ask you to speak up or, or move closer? Can you hear me now? It's Not still quite quiet. Well. Uh, you can hear me now? Yes. yes. Uh, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I will be just uh, providing a good practice of uh, some of our HLP activities in Somalia, building on what uh, my colleague a national NGO responding to humanitarian situation in Somalia, an active HLP and protection cluster member. So next uh, slide, please. So, Based on the overview, in Somalia, women remain uh, disenfranchised in almost uh, every facet of life, more so in ac uh, accessing HLP rights. And uh, this is further compounded by the incognible uh, social norms, the social norms that are available within Somali cultures that further entrenches and continues to inhibit their progress in the contemporary society, accessing human, uh, some of the services across the IDPs and uh, majorly the HLP, housing, land and property rights. So next slide, please. So basically, I will just wish to, prepare, to present to you the NOFIL, uh, housing, land, and uh, property-specific uh, services that we have been conducting in Somalia. We have been operating mobile legal clinic, legal aid clinics in most of the IDPs in Somalia to provide the legal aid services for the people who, for the, uh, for the IDPs who are at risk of eviction and those who have been affected by eviction, providing counseling services and advice to the affected population in Somalia, providing uh, awareness either to the most vulnerable uh, and uh, those who are at risk uh, of evictions and uh, those who can't access housing, land and property rights, we have been providing awareness. Similarly, we have been providing a legal HLP dialogue session to create social cohesion, peaceful coexistence and advocate for women HLP rights among the communities. The dialogue, uh, the dialogue uh, consisted of uh, different uh, different uh, members of the community, majorly women, those who are living with disabilities, those are the most who are uh, usually affected by the, by the evictions once they occur. Next slide, please. So I will just wish to present to you a case study where we have uh, a name of the beneficiary has been changed for the passports of uh, security. Muslimo is a mother of five from Iskashi IDP sites in Somalia. Ever since her husband died, she has been involved in an intense battle with her late husband's family who wanted her out of the property. Just because she wanted to marry another man instead of uh, her late husband's brother. So as a result, she has been receiving numerous threats 
from her late husband's uh, family, which included taking away the children from her, as well as uh, evicting her from her household. So next slide, please. So Muslima just, uh, just uh, contacted the no-field hotline numbers that uh, is being used by or within IDP sites uh, and reported the incidents where the no-field protection teams had to go to immediately respond to her case. So the monitors registered her case and provided her with psychosocial support to help her deal with the trauma that comes with the, with the, the situation that she has gone through. The monitors as well sat down with her late husband's family together with the community leaders to try to sort out the difference with it with, without much success. So because they wanted uh, the land and uh, it was much harder for her to, 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 to sort her the issues. So Muslimo requested if she can be relocated to a different IDP site with her, her children. So the Nofil HLP team with the permission from her late husband's family, decided to, with the support from the camp management committees and different, uh, different stakeholders within the IDP sites, managed to, to relocate her to a different uh, IDP site in the Inile district. So Muslima was provided with uh, cash assistance and food package to help her settle in her new settlement. So next slide, please. So forced eviction has been happening with abandon in most of the IDP sites in Somalia and uh, represent a constant risk for women. So women are disappropriately affected with under those uh, rights, whose rights are violated either directly or indirectly by immediate family members and uh, the community at large. Some of uh, the time, Forced eviction are also exacerbating the risk of gender-based violence among women and reduce women's access to HLP, uh, HLP rights. So next slide, please. So majorly those who are affected are the female-headed household in accessing HLP rights. So eviction mostly in Somalia leads to family separation and women are always sidelined in land decision making most of the time. Eviction have more negative impact on women due to loss of household property, financial savings that you usually, usually save at times. So most of the time, destruction of uh, critical infrastructures like school create more responsibility for women to take care of children who remain at home most of the time. Some of the HLP assets owned by women or obtained as part of inheritance may be lost during most of the eviction, once the eviction occurs. So next slide, please. So some of the good practices that we have been, we have been using and uh, we have been integrating GB, GBV actors into most of, the, most of our existing HLP information sessions. We have as well engaged both men and women on HLP rights. This is majorly to change uh, attitudes and perception in how they view the women HLP rights. So we have been engaging local authority in spearheading IDP uh, land owners platform. For example, we have been using the case study in Baidoa where the local authority were providing alternative land for resettlement. Provision of hotline numbers to report any threat of eviction. For example, if there is any case of eviction, we might be, we might be, we might be taken into action on how to solve them as well. So we have been integrating complaint and feedback mechanism where we have been receiving different complaints from, uh, from the camp resident on uh, how they were being evicted and uh, they were having uh, lease agreements that were valid. So we have been formalizing, we have been working on formalizing uh, tenure, for example, changing land tenure document from verbal agreement into, for example, a five years lease agreement. Engaging, 
So engaging influential individuals in the community, uh, such as religious leaders, to explain the benefits of ensuring women are empowered with HLP rights. Some of the lessons learned that we have uh, learned at once while, while we were implementing our HLP activities, we have learned that improving coordination through existing structures, such as community centers, where women are brought together and they are being informed on, on uh, the, the, available, the available information on housing, land, and property. Using existing alternative dispute resolution, such structures such as uh, dialogue groups to respond to HLP issues. Engaging engagement of multi-stakeholders multi enhance knowledge on women's rights and uh, other HLP issues. Strengthening the capacity of municipalities to respond to forced eviction and other HLP issues. Some, some, uh, some, some encounters, uh, you might encounter some, uh, some fake or made up evictions that uh, they can counter the local authority once they are, uh, they are uh, capacitated. So we have been using uh, use of visual arts Invisibility, for example, invisibility material targeting community members who can't read, and uh, building capacity of uh, women in leadership roles. So this is a right-based approach toward awareness campaign and related intervention, mixed dialogue groups, all contributing to more women engagement in HLP rights. So next slide, please. So this is uh, some of the tutorial on forced eviction in Belkhair IDP sites in Mogadishu. On my left, on my right, left hand side, you can see forced eviction response services that has been provided by the Northfield team, the psychosocial support and the food distribution that has been provided for the evicted beneficiaries. So next slide, please. So you can uh, you can find uh, the more resources on uh, the Nofil website, the NRC Somalia, as well as the Protection Cluster. So the key, key contact persons you can uh, reach out to are the Banati Regional Administration, Evelyn Aero, who is acting HLP coordinator in Somalia, as well as um, Safa Abdi, the project manager Nofil, Christine Arthur who is the Senior Protection Cluster Coordinator UNHCR. Thank you. Back to you, Evelyn. Yes, uh, thank you, Mustafa. So it's also good for us to hear from local actors that have access to certain locations that we are able to deliver HLP services. But what is important to note is that you highlight key issues that women face, not just because of the general HLP violations, but when they are forcefully uh, evicted. It's also important to see that uh, using men as advocates for displaced women's HLP rights is a strategy that can increase women's access to housing, land, and property. We also see that harmful customary practices do feature uh, heavily in your presentation, but also it's important for us to know that sometimes custom is used to interpret legal provisions and even religious provisions that provide certain protections to women's housing, land, and property rights. Uh, it's also good to note that there are certain solutions to these challenges that women are facing and some of the good practices and the lessons that you have learned that you've been able to use to promote women's HLP rights, empowering women, uh, using, uh, identifying the coping mechanisms that women use to address their HLP rights and ensuring that you are able to contribute or build on to this, creating an enabling environment as well, uh, capacity building and capacity development, this uh, features a lot. So thank you so much. Uh, hand of applause to our uh, panelists this afternoon. Those have been very enriching discussions. I would now like to hand over to Jim, who will take us through the Q&A. Over to you, Jim. 
Thanks, Evelyn. And please do, if um, if questions stand out to you as well, please do um, raise them. Um, so you have the link to the Jamboard. You've been adding some great comments and questions there. And I just want to start off with uh, a question um, that it was um, asked a few times for Rhoda, but was also probably relevant for um, probably all of the speakers, which is about the need for ID and assistance. So the question was, uh, there was several questions around how, what about those without valid ID? Um, are you able to assist those without ID? And, and, and the, just the importance of having ID. And I know uh, some people work on that issue specifically and others don't. But Rhoda, maybe you could address that first and then we can go to uh, others. Yeah, thank you very much, Jim. Um, as on the issue of the ID, uh, one of the mandates of um, IOM is to monitor displacement among IDPs. So usually there's what we call um, the D um, DTM card, the Displacement Tracking Metrics card, that is usually issued to all IDPs that have been registered. And the uh, importance of the ID card is that it is used to track the movement, the mobility of this um, IDPs. And since most of the IDPs that are currently in the location where the implementation took place, are mostly from Borno State. Most of them have already received registration of that ID card. We, of course, found a few who had either lost the ID card or were never registered in the first place. So we worked in collaboration with the DTM unit here in IOM to register those participants, issue them with a displacement tracking uh, metrics card, and then they were able to participate on the project. But also, um, all thanks to NRC here in Nigeria, who is currently collaborating with the National Identity Management Commission in provision of um, identity, identity documentation, especially for IDPs in camps. Most of our participants were able to access one form of um, the national identification card, all thanks to NRC Nigeria. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rhoda. So, yeah, so if their ID is lacking, then you try and find ways to establish some kind of identification. So um, I'll pass to the team in uh, Syria, and uh, I, I, I believe you work on this issue. So, yeah, Laura, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, I mean, we do have this uh, problem in Syria and in the region as well, as many Syrians lost their document or were uh, in this place in area which were outside of the control of the government, so where uh, official uh, identification documents were not available. So we have cases uh, across the region of uh, Syrian who don't have the document, have alternative documents, have document issued by de facto authorities, but by customary authorities, for example, Mukhtars and others, or don't have um, the complete set of documents. So we are, we are dealing with uh, uh, underdocumented, uh, undocumented, uh, documented with different type of documents. And I think the key really is to ensure that vulnerable people, which are the one underdocumented or non-documented are not left behind. So uh, we have a regional level found solution in terms of accepting any form of identification that the person can produce or if these are not available, we are also using two witness uh, so that the person can, someone can, uh, you know, testify that uh, this is so and so, and so that the humanitarian assistance can can be given. So I think this is something that also NRC uh, has as an internal policy, but we're also working with the other sector because this was also a concern for, for example, uh, dissemination of non-food items or distribution of other humanitarian assistance where uh, ID cards were unfortunately required. And so there was also the risk that the most vulnerable one were left behind. Thank you and over. Thanks, Lara. Yes, it's that, that issue that those that don't have the ID are often the most vulnerable. So how do we work in a way that is accountable and transparent, but support those people that need it most. Um, uh, Fatih, did you have uh, any uh, reflection on that question um, from your experience? Yes, I mean, um, the practicality of that question, particularly in a place like Somalia, um, 
is also very challenging, but I really um, find it fascinating that that comment came up and it makes me happy because it also shows that people are really starting to understand that things that might otherwise be simple and straightforward can have a disproportionate impact on women, right? So something as simple as ID, um, is that realistic for all women, um, especially in cases of displacement where what local authority are you gonna go to to secure that ID, right? Um, so it's really showing and some of the work that we do too is really looking at how just policies and legislation and rules and regulations can have that disproportionate impact because it does seem like a standard requirement that you would need to show ID, but what is behind it and for us to kind of interrogate how realistic that is for everyone. It's another issue of access. Thanks, Fatih. Uh, Mustafa, did you have any experience with um, your work with NoFil um, in Somalia, how you um, deal with the issue of ID and the need for ID? From our side, as Fatih said, ID has not been a real issue here. It's, uh, it's not something that people have had access to. They don't have any access to identification document. Uh, it has been a challenge accessing uh, the, the land rights and uh, the coming into accessing the land uh, land documentation at, uh, at the point is an issue. So it is you bringing uh, the person uh, who you knows you is uh, your point of identification. Thank you. So so yeah, using the the people you the communities that getting people who know people to act as a form of identification, um, and Laura, you mentioned as well different types of identification, different types of evidence that might show who you are or a link to a particular place or space. Yeah, thank you, thank you, everybody. Um, one more question, and sadly, I think this might be the last one, but we'll see. But it's it's a question a few people have asked about, but it's about how you engage with. Um, well, so one question was asking specifically about engagement with like male stakeholders. So that could be in families, households, community level. Um, another person asked about um, engaging with um, sort of non-state armed groups as well. To, so I wondered if you had any reflections on how to engage with, I suppose, with those that you might see as needing to be persuaded on, on, on what we want to do to see uh, women improve their HLP rights. Who would like to go first thinking about that one? It's a big question. Do any of you work? With, yeah, go on, Fatih. Fatih, go ahead. Sorry, okay, yeah, sorry. No, um, again, I think um, I mentioned in my presentation too that this isn't um, a women's only issue, that it really requires collective work. Um, and one of the things too that we really need to think about is sometimes um, there might even be backlash if you're just constantly promoting women's rights in a way where it might seem to others that you're somehow taking something away from them. And we know that land um, and property are really contentious. They're really um, emotionally driven. They're very valuable assets to people. And so having that sort of, um, you know, defensive mechanism to it is something that might naturally happen. And so we need to bring people in to kind of understand that giving rights to vulnerable groups is not going to take away rights from other groups. Um, and I've seen a lot of um, reports that come out that kind of people justify why women don't deserve or need their HLP rights. Um, and it always somehow comes back to their reliance or dependency on male relatives, right? Um, and so we really need to push forward the narrative that this is really about individual autonomy and agency. And again, just basic human rights um, and not about women taking on a more uh, second-class citizen role within their societies. Thanks. Would anyone else like to talk about that, how we engage with others in, in this? Yeah, Laura, go ahead. Yes, I think, uh, I mean, uh, also for the serial response, uh, this is a sensitive issue, of course, uh, but uh, women themselves, especially in, in the region, clearly express the desire to find solutions that allow them to uh, obtain some security of tenure, 
uh, but also at the same time maintain the relationship with their family. So the social network and the importance of this uh, relationship with family has to remain, especially during displacement and in a post-conflict uh, situation. So uh, there was quite a lot of interest, for example, to uh, explore the use of mediation and negotiation and finding solution within the family, but also really keeping and managing the dispute uh, and these, you know, difference of opinion <clears throat> with regards to what are the rights, uh, you know, of sisters or the rights of the brothers uh, in the family so that this can be resolved in the family in order not to bring shame, uh, but also really, as I said, to maintain these very important uh, family ties that, that women need to have for, for their survival. So engaging with the men of the family to find the solution is key. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Um, anyone else like to come in on this one? Okay, well, thank you for your, your oui, comments. Um, oh, sorry. No, il y a Isidore qui voulait dire quelque chose. Um, okay, so, um, did Vous you have a, a question? Oui, moi, je suis Isidore de la RDC. Je voulais faire un petit commentaire par rapport à ça. Uh, sorry, I... No, does that uh, um, if you Jim, no. just go into the English, English channel. channel. Yeah, sure, got it. Thanks. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Sorry. Merci beaucoup, uh, vraiment pour uh, ce thème qui est tellement tellement riche. C'est vrai, la situation uh, des droits de la femme, ça pose toujours des problèmes parce que en cet moment, uh, je considère ça comme c'est devenu comme uh, une loi où uh, quelque chose qu'on veut chercher à stigmatiser même la femme. Si on devrait considérer la femme comme un être aimé, comme tout le monde, et parler des droits de l'homme et non chercher à mettre une certaine spécificité. Parce que moi, je suis juriste ici chez nous. Euh, effectivement, quand les législateurs élaborent les textes, ils ne font pas allusion vraiment à la femme. Euh, des fois, vous sentez bien que ce soit un droit écrit, mais que de fois, ça reste comme si on était encore dans les droits coutumiers. Effectivement, chez nous ici, en République démocratique du Congo, au nord Kivu, d'habitude, euh, la femme est liée aux propriétés de l'homme et non l'inverse. Et que souvent, dans beaucoup de familles, quand le mari meurt, euh, de fois, la femme, on l'explique facilement. Si elle n'avait pas de bonnes relations, avec le membre de la famille. Parce que ça, c'est aussi un élément très important. Parce que des fois, la femme peut penser qu'elle a des droits, mais elle oublie qu'elle aussi, elle a des obligations. Et que parmi les obligations, font, les obligations sociales font partie vraiment un élément de base pour permettre à la femme aussi de jouir de certaines propriétés, même à la mort de son mari. Voilà un peu ce que Et je pourrais Isadore, I'm really sorry to um, to cut you off. Um, thank you so much for your comments. We just we only have uh, a few minutes left, and I need to just move on to our final speaker. So thank you for you were highlighting some real key um, issues there. It, feel free to write in the um, uh, in the chat um, because what we're going to do is record, gather everything together that's been said, and put that as part of the report. So thank you for um, your intervention. Um, I'd like to welcome now um, Adam Schumacher from uh, uh, USAID, who is going to offer some closing remarks. Adam's the acting team leader for the Gender, Age and Social Inclusion team in the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. And I pass to him with great thanks for all our panellists uh, for your interventions today. Um, Adam. Uh, thanks, Jim. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers of the Global Protection Forum and in particular, those who made this session on women's housing, land, and property rights in the humanitarian assistance response possible. I would also like to thank the panelists and the presenters on the case studies of Nigeria, Somalia, and Syria, who provided incredibly insightful and compelling perspectives on the challenges that displaced women face with HLP rights in these respective countries. To that end, I also greatly appreciate that these discussions also focused on viable and durable solutions that we all collectively can learn from. I am very pleased 
to be here today as a representative of the US government. We recognize that HLP is a vital issue for people who are forcibly displaced and consequently very often face the urgent basic need of safe shelter. The US government also recognizes that HLP is not just a question of shelter, but also one of protection. It's clear that the lack of HLP rights can hamper access to humanitarian assistance and life-saving services and pose a major risk for sexual exploitation, abuse, and extortion. This goes beyond a humanitarian initial issue. It's critical to all our efforts to bridge the humanitarian development nexus. HLP is one of the principal factors for determining the economic and social well-being of women and other vulnerable groups, especially in situations of conflict and reconstruction when their rights are violated on a mass scale. As we heard today, the simple fact is, is that women's HLP needs are dis disproportionate because land rights and tenure systems actively discriminate against them. Social practices that exclude women from land and property ownership are all too common. As the number of forcibly displaced people continues to increase as a result of conflict, crises, and climate change, so does the number of women who face discriminatory HLP practices. Case in point, men globally, in, globally men's land holding, holdings are almost three times the size of those of women. These discussions today on Nigeria, Somalia, and Syria underscore that addressing HLP is representative of the important link between gender equality, durable solutions, and HDP nexus outcomes. The US government is committed to addressing barriers to safe, habitable living spaces for all. In fact, US government funded HLP programming around the world has expanded in recent years. We've supported partners to provide community awareness raising on HLP rights and legal assistance to secure land tenure and lease documentation. We also have increased our advocacy engagements with authorities to promote equitable provision of post-disaster shelter. Our partners also implement community-based prevention measures such as dispute resolution on HLP rights and, of, and all these efforts must include particular attention on the impact of HLP rights on women and other vulnerable populations. Looking forward, the US government seeks to strengthen engagements with other fellow donors, implementing partners and global coordination groups such as this forum, as well as the global camp management and camp coordination HLP working group and under the Global Shelter Cluster. This coordinate, these coordination efforts are essential to further defining and in some cases refining global standards in HLP coordination, advocacy and programming, as well as HLP, uh, HLP field level coordination clusters. This is why it is so essential to enhance cross-culture uh, collabor collaboration with humanitarian shelter and protection actors to ultimately create better and safer HLP outcomes. Despite our progress to date, HLP needs worldwide, HLP needs worldwide are remain acute. On behalf of the US government, we are grateful to the organizers for bringing this community of practice together and for the opportunity to learn from practitioners who face these challenges every day. Thank you, you all, and looking forward to growing our partnership in this important work. Thanks so much, Adam. Really appreciate those comments. Um, and uh, yeah, and thank you to all of our speakers today. Thank you to Brigitte, Evelyn, Rhoda, Mustafa, Fatih, Shireen, Laura, Mai, and Adam. Um, it's been a fantastic session today. And just to, a couple of things just to mention, just as we sign off, if you'd like to be on the HLP AOR mailing list and receive the newsletter, I've just posted the link there for you to sign up. Um, please do have a look at this newsletter. It's, it talks to a lot of the issues we've discussed today. Um, and uh, if you need to get in touch with me as the AOR coordinator, please do. Um, my email is hopefully going to just be put in the chat as well. Um, but if not, you can find it through the website. And um, yeah, just to say there is a specific theme of the HLP AOR that, that focuses on displaced women's HLP. So if you would like to be involved in that, then um, please do get in touch. 
Um, but that is it from us. Just want to say thank you so much. There will be a, a report and some follow up. We'll draw together the comments from the Jamboard and from, from all of you. Um, so um, yes, just want to say thank you so much for your time, for your participation. And um, yeah, let's keep in touch. Thank you, everybody.